David Parker Wise, what attracted you in the first place to the People's Temple? Um, my background coming from a small town in Texas set me, set the stage for my meeting the People's Temple. Ironically, as difficult to follow as that might be, I can explain it very shortly. Sure. My father was handicapped on one side. His name was Joy, Joy Parker. And, uh, you know, I often asked him how he didn't go by his middle name, Willard, and go by Will. And he said, if I never have anything to offer you, son, you'll always be the only son of joy you'll ever meet. Oh, okay. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and so he was a real s sweetheart. I'll try to quit moving around so the screen doesn't come in and out. Okay. But, um, so he was a real sweetheart. And then my stepfather who participated with my mother, God God bless her, uh, in stealing me from him, my, my real father. He, in, I, I know that <clears throat> I've got some half-blood uh, siblings that uh, don't want to hear it, but he looked just like Adolf Hitler and acted just like Adolf Hitler. So I had this paradigm of a really loving Christ-like figure in my father, Joy, and of a fascist where I would put on the wall who keeps the keeper and he would beat me and my brother and that was everybody got that back then. I left out of Texas where I had basically ruined my back doing child labor for this uh, totalitarian figure uh, that was not capable of ever telling my mother I love you or telling his half sons I love you and I left out looking for a better world and I knew that I was born for some reason, and so I went to uh, San Francisco, and basically I tried the major religions from Buddhism, and um, the, the, as close as I got to the Vedic ones was the, people, the Hare Krishnas. So I shaved my head and had a ponytail and studied, uh, veget you know, the vegetarianism was the first introduction I had to vegetarianism, so I'm a vegetarian today. Okay. You know, I, I remember telling um, Jim Jones, you know, something he said, but it tastes good, you know, like that's a rationale. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> so the bottom line is, is that um, I was disappointed by the power games that took place even in these religions. You know, there was like, like the Hare Krishna's, for instance, if you said Prabhu, that means master. Theoretically, everyone's equally humble if we all call each other master. You know, you, you, you say, you know, you could take it any way you want. You could all call each other servant, and we're all democratically equal in some way. So, <clears throat> you know, I noticed the guy would say, Prabhu, over here, more Java, or whatever it was, because I was serving. I was volunteering to clean, to serve, to serve, as I was searching, you know, the truth, looking for the truth. And my, my basic belief at that time was just in heaven on earth, and I listened to the Moody Blues a lot. Okay. So, here we, yeah, so here we have it. Um, you know, I thought, do you say, come here, uh, master, like that? And so I said, that's hypocrisy. See? So I, was, I was, thought, who will I try next? What, what religion can I try next? And so... Um, there was this gal named Jenny Lambrev on the street. She was a member of People's Temple. She showed me this flyer. It meant nothing to me. And uh, um, she said, well, he doesn't, he's non-materialistic. Jim Jones is non-materialistic, and he doesn't uh, uh, believe in this and believe in that, just like you. He talks the way you talk. I said, no, no. And so... Hmm. Uh, so I walked out of there, and I went to the, uh, I was the only Hare Krishna that uh, Jim Jones said he ever had. <laughs> oh, so you walked into the People's Temple, but in your Hare Krishna. <laughs> with pink, yeah, with a pink robe and the ponytail on the back of the head. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, wow. and I, re I remember the, the, the head, um, what we might call in Facebook talk, admins. You know, they had counselors. Uh, they were very interested in me because I was a philosopher. I was a young philosopher. See? Mm -hmm. So they were engaging me out there. And so Jim Jones is very interested in me because my, uh, everybody kept saying, he sh you share a lot of ideas. 
And so he came around after the meeting, which I was not impressed with his style. Hmm. I mean, <clears throat> since I was not a materialistic person, I was not emotionally bowled over to hear somebody talk like say, you know, like, like, believe or I mean, I wasn't, sure, I wasn't, sure. you know, impressed with um, impersonations of power or anything like that. I thought, what are you up to? What's going on? What are you saying? Yeah, yeah. And so the idea that I was willing to give him credit that healings might be real. Well, that's because that was me. I was willing to th anything could be real until I see some evidence that it's not, I you see. know, wow. uh, but he came after the meeting and said, we'd like to have you come up on the buses with us to uh, Ukiah. So after that first meeting in San Francisco, I went up to Ukiah and became like a model devotee, like I was in all the other religions, as that was my way of looking for the truth. So Ukiah, just so folks understand, uh, that's where the People's Temple sort of settled first, right? Once they left Indiana, went to Ukiah. Later they set up the church in San Francisco, but they maintained this property in, in Ukiah. They rolled into Ukiah from Indiana with ball tires and faith, and they were on a low budget. He had to sort of begin again. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. yeah. And Ukiah, he began again. You know, he... Yeah. It, 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 so the Jim Jones that I remember, yeah. Sorry about the ice cream, and I said, "Call me over there before it melts." You know, but um, yeah. the Jim Jones that I met was not the same Jim Jones that I got away from. Right, uh, and so this is what, I, you know, kind of my my next question. You must have been impressed, or at least intrigued, because you agreed to go with them to Ukiah. Uh, you're you're putting yourself into their hands. You don't know. You know, you can't be certain about what's going to happen. What, what was it that impressed you at the outset? Well, the outset is that he wanted to make an, a, um, a social experiment um, upholding equality in a more real kind of way than we see around us in the world. Uh, it's like um, he actually tried to get black folk from a black culture and white folk from a white culture to accept and love each other equally. And, do you, and, and do, do you think this was sincere? Um, <clears throat> I think it was sincere from the time when he was uh, in uh, the Human Rights Commissioner in Indianapolis. Um, I think that he was phony to some degree that can be, you know, uh, pinpointed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think that on the other hand, um, you know, his psychological problems were not overwhelming him. I met many people. I traveled to all of the religions that had big churches across America for a multiple of years while I was investigating what other people were doing. Yeah. And, what, and I met people that, that, that were, they would have been much worse than Jim Jones had they had the power to be that way. They were just like weak little people that, it, that, that seemed to be more pathetic they just didn't have the power to be that destructive with their pathetic nature mm. and so basically if he had not gotten into um, amphetamine addiction and to amphetamine use to help make him look more superman like to stay up long hours and be more dedicated and uh, to run you know run and not get weary and to sure. blah 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 and not you know uh if he had not uh, become uh addicted to amphetamines i think he would have been able to hold his um undermining elements at bay the way most people do sure yeah so you were but you were impressed by what appeared to be a genuine a genuine movement of racial togetherness and 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 sort of communal you know a, a community <coughs> working at to be something different yeah so entering the people's temple was an opportunity to get involved in politics it was an opportunity to get involved in humanitarianism and it was an opportunity to have family for a lot of people that were asking these questions about why we're in vietnam and why did my family throw me out 
because you were opposed to it. And all I'm telling you is I went in there offering an inhuman level of human service to that group. And uh, yeah, I went everywhere, volunteered for everything, and I worked two jobs and gave all the money from two jobs, and I did everything. And um, if there was uh, work going on in an organic garden, I went there. You're if there. we were handing out food I, I, in our clothing, I went there. If there's any program at all. So I signed up to be a lawyer. To, I wanted to be a lawyer for the church, and Jim proposed at that time before he'd been burnt. He was a once bit 20,000 times shy. If he ever got burnt, he, he was quick to the sourpuss position. He already had trouble with, um, with being, uh, had too much disdain. And, you know, and, uh, you know, and so <clears throat> when the so-called group of eight, they're just, you know, eight college kids I was going to college with. You know, up at, up at Santa Rosa Community College, is that where they were? Santa Rosa Community College. I was in more things than anybody that's ever been in the church. I was in everything. And uh, so, you know, I know all the college uh, kids that were there yeah. and, and know what all that's about. But <clears throat> it's important to understand that he felt they burned him. So he quit offering any pay for anybody to go to school. Yeah. Well, let me let me just pause real quick, just so folks listening know, and, and correct me if I get this wrong. But the group of eight these were these were students who were going to Santa Rosa Community College up in Santa Rosa, California. But they saw a number of things in the People's Temple that they disagreed with. They I think they wrote a group letter just sort of making criticisms of the temple. And so this is sort of a, a an example of sort but of was, an early Santa group. Rosa Santa Rosa Junior College. Or Santa Rosa Junior College, yeah. Yeah, it was an expensive, it was perceived as a prestigious college. Yeah. So, th so these were students, this is sort of a, an early example of folks who are beginning to speak out against the, the temple. <laughs> but their reason, arguably, you know, we, you could, you'd have a good time putting me on with uh, some of the survivors like Jim Cobb, who's pretty open-minded. But the reason was because of just some primary differences as a reason stated. These are some young kids that really wanted to play around a bit. I mean, they really wanted to cut their, kick their heels up a bit. And, uh, and they wanted to experiment with ideas at the time, like should we engage in violent revolution? Jim Jones is not gonna engage in, and, and do anything that's gonna count. And should we blow up a nuclear power plant or something? Now, everybody that's watching this, that wants to take a clip of me saying that, I've got uh, this professor here witnessing, I was not part of that sentiment, and I only described their private thoughts that not everybody knows about. Sure. And it had nothing to do, I would never endorse such a, a right. thing, because I, I believe that um, um, the end does not justify the means, but under the wrong means undermines the correct end and anybody with some real maturity will know knows that yeah uh, but these yeah. guys they, they were bothered by some principal things last point they were bothered by some principal things like the all white governance of the of the temple yeah. and so that that was a legitimate concern sure but it's then the black majority it, church but the leadership was white that's one of the things they were concerned about. Yeah. He had people that were um, sexually loyal to him, like these inner girls that were digging through trash cans so that he could be a prophet. Oh, like digging out people's like letters or personal information. Thanks for playing on one. him, and then he would act like he got it by the spirit of revelation, like. Yeah. I, I I see here I have uh, the spirit has told me you your house it, it's the bathroom is painted blue and beside the bathroom where it's blue and then he would you know whatever you know yeah. because one of these girls pretended their car broke down and then they said can I can I use your phone can I go to the bathroom they looked through the medicine cabinet 
find out everything wrong with that person. And then when that person's uh, come back to the church, they don't even remember or even think that it's possible that that gal who claimed that her car broke down and she needed to use the telephone looked through the medicine cabinet and gave all the names of the meds to Jim Jones. His stopping financing people to go to college had nothing to do with anything other than distrust yeah. of anyone else and distrust. He thought people believed in him. And, you know, like a narcissist, he took that so serious when they were able to walk away. Right. And they took it so serious that in Guyana, they weren't able to walk away. Yeah. And they were. They were. But they also were a mixed bag of uh, insanities and everything. You know, but they could have just walked out in the jungle. And then they'd have needed to get clear and not of any punishment if they didn't make it. And people did walk out in the jungle and escape, you know. But anyway, here's what happened. Um, Jim asked me to go to Los Angeles, that he was going to set up a uh, church that he had bought for like um, $200,000. Now probably worth, worth probably about, I don't know, man, maybe $50 million. Wow, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a historic um, old uh, Christian science building. So when I was a pastor there, it was like being the um, in a, your own tower, you know, it was a, pa it was a castle. It was yeah. a castle. Yeah, it was a castle. And so for a young man of uh, 19 years old to be a pastor, um, and so what he said, uh, can you go, you've worked in the church of the most dedicated person I ever saw in the church. Can you go down there? I know I can rely on you and set up the programs that you've learned here. Yeah. And so I went to Los Angeles. I began setting the church up there uh, according to the idealism that I was familiar with in Ukiah upon first arriving. Yeah. Now, from the moment I went there, Ukiah group began changing just as he was transforming. And then in um, San Francisco, the people there began when he uh, got the uh, temple in San Francisco uh, to where that later when I went to uh, planning commission meetings, I was shocked that it wasn't even the same guy. I was shocked that the whole, the whole principles upon which it had been founded and everything like that were, seemed to be out the window. But here's the answer of the equation that I wanted to you know, make clear. Uh, <clears throat> when he came to Los Angeles and he said, I can't believe how you, you went and got a job on the side and you've been donating that money. And uh, you've got a, uh, like a, um, a little cheap apartment right across from the church. Uh, just, you know, and uh, you're paying for that. He said, I want I wanted you to move into the church. And he said, and everything you're doing is just unbelievable. It reminds me, he said, of when I uh, was younger. And you've got everything I wanted. A church in a big city and um, this kind of thing. And then yeah. someone would say, you know, say, well, <clears throat> and he had... I'll bring that up later, but he, he said uh, from the pulpit, you know, I looked out across the world and uh, Dave Wise was, and he's the new resident pastor here. And then he kicked his feet up. I think he had on this white robe, you know, and I, I began wearing black and purple and blue robes around after that, you know, and uh, yeah. but he, he kicked his feet up in the offertory room, which is also the counseling room and he said you know kind of jokingly like you don't mind that I uh, appointed you to be the resident pastor do you I said well it's, it's uh, you already did it well you know I said it's an, it'd be an honor I said it's an honor he said good and then after that then um, you know there'd be like need to vote for uh, who's gonna be a counselor the people in the planning commission didn't get to pick that I would. 
Jim would say, well, what about such and such? I'd say, well, he's got this problem and that problem and this problem. He'd say, well, you use your own best judgment. Then the people came to me and they said, you're the only, like Mike uh, uh, Prokes and uh, um, uh, the, the Professor Trop, yeah, you know, yeah. and he would, and he said, we all agreed you, you, in the planning commission, we were talking that you know more about what it's like to be Jim Jones than anybody in the church. You know, they're just talking about the work. Yeah. The, the workload. Yeah. What, what, what kind of programs did you set up at the temple in, in Los Angeles? Well, we, uh, I was trying to allude earlier that the sense of a family in a time in the country where there was a lot of division. Yeah. What had, had really was waning and, and, um, you know, um, making a, a group into a family sometimes involves uh, getting involved in people's lives in a positive way and offering them help. Yeah. I mean, we would, we would pay people's mortgages uh, mm -hmm. where they were about to lose their home, yeah. buy one another car when the uh, their car was stolen, when they were... Yeah. We, we had food programs and uh, me medical uh, programs even. We got like um, yeah. sickle cell anemia shots for everyone that was black, and and ninety nine percent of the folk. I did funerals where if you ever saw, uh, see, and I know what I can say in a fully black audience, and everybody looks at me, I shake their head, and like, yeah, you worded it right, but he wouldn't have, you know what I mean? Mm. Just like if Joe, we were at a funeral, he says. Yeah, well, you know, you people, blah, blah, blah. I looked over at Jim. I said, you can't say you people. You, you know, you can say you folk. And Jim said, you folk. And this girl is from Red River Valley there, young girl in some training, minion training position, says, how dare you talk to father like that? How dare? Jim said, no, he, he's right. He's right, you know. Wow. He's right. Wow. Yeah. No, but so... You you said a minute ago though that after you got to L.A. you would go back to San Francisco and you noticed that jo that Jones was changing or that Jones had changed. Well, the r real downhill uh, at a fast rate was when uh, I was asked to uh, come. Um, it was Karen Layton who uh, said that you know uh, Jim agrees that your honesty and. Um, your honesty would really be valuable in the planning commission. We would like you to fly uh, every other weekend or whatever it was. I can't remember. Uh, maybe once a month. I can't. I, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, we would like you to fly to uh, San Francisco. Then we'd get on in cars and drive up to Ukiah. This very odd thing, you know. Go like back to where everybody was first got started and yeah. do all that. And, and the planning commissions were in a, like a nursing home, the front of a nursing home uh, that belonged to Sweeney or something like that. It was being managed yeah. by. Yeah. So when I, when I went there, I thought, well, these people are crazy. They're crazy. Well, he's, gone, he's gone power mad. I didn't learn until <clears throat> later that he was addicted to amphetamines. I was in charge of the room that he stayed in and Los Angeles, and so yeah. he would, you know, his pill bag was in there, and uh, I could see that he was addicted to amphetamines, so I went to the library and looked it all up and learned that the regular use of mental ward-like amphetamines, uh, of uh, amphetamines causes mental ward-like uh, yeah. Yeah. symptoms. You know? now, when, when, you, when you saw that, did you initially, you know, sort of push down any reservations you had? I mean, did it did it take a while for you to get to a place where you you decided yourself in 1976 it's time for me to it's time for me to go? What was that process like for you? You know, from you first see things to you get to the place where you say I I've, I've got to I got to go. Professor Jones, I think that uh, a lot of us uh, were taken in increments like the slow boil frog. Yeah. But for me, that it was a bit different because as an insider, uh, I was being explained why. And so in the beginning, years uh, earlier, 
I watched him do a bait and switch with the Father Divine people where he invited everyone, like the scripture says, to, uh, you know, you can be 30-fold God or 40-fold God or 50-fold God. Let God, let love live in you. You can basically assassinate the, you can kill the ego in yourself and let principle and, lo and love and truth become what you are. And this was like, again, a Pentecostal belief, you know, uh, to where the, and so um, what he did is a bait and switch. He sold everybody on the notion of accepting him saying, um, I'm God, and then saying, and you're God, and you're God. And then suddenly he switched it, uh, either the bait and switch, and switched it over to, and until you can learn how to be a God, then I'll be God. I'll be God. God Almighty God. And so he was like, uh, I'm a vocalist, so I can sound like anybody. You do a very good imitation of him. <clears throat> yeah. So Jim Jones was shooting to be Father Divine when the very people, like even on his intellectual white-ish staff, yeah. that were atheistic, preferably, uh, yeah. were, were being told, uh, well, I have to do this. I have to do this. That without uh, a hero and a godlike figure for people, uh, they'll choose they'll choose a make-believe one. It's yeah. the only way that I can knock down the sky god. And I'm, I'm trying to bring revolution through religion. I'm using religion to try to bring revolution. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just using it as a vehicle. Well, and I have yeah, let me, let me ask you a question to back up. So you're a, you're a pastor at L.A., and I'm, I'm assuming that this also then involves preaching sermons on Sunday. So what, what did you preach about? Did you actually preach biblical sermons or did you preach political, did you offer political speeches? What, what did you actually speak about on Sunday? Well, Jim Jones, Jim Jones came down, pre preface, preface it with one comment. He came down every two weeks. Oh, okay. He did a sermon. He did a sermon every um, two weeks on Saturday and on Sunday. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I was in charge of the church the rest of the time. So one time he said, um, after they had found me and brought me back to the church, then uh, he said, well, we're going to get something on this, on this day. He'd been running around here. We ain't got nothing on him. He gets to walk out if he don't agree with nothing. Oh, you mean they don't have anything on you to blackmail you if you, if you want to go? Yeah. All right. So they said, so we're going to send him to make a threatening call to the Myrtles with his good friend, Mike Brooks, uh, witnessing it. And so he sent me to the payphone, and um, I said, uh, uh, so Jim wanted to make this call, right? He just didn't have time, right? I said, I guess so. I said, so he wishes that he could make this call, making these threats, right? Jim does. He just is a busy man, right? Brooke said, yeah. I said, so you won't mind if I sound like Jim when I do it, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, so I said, you know, and you myrtles and blah, 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 blah. So then the phones lit up everywhere. They said, Jim Jones has threatened our life. Jim Jones has called up. We've got him on a tape recording threatening our life and everything. Everybody looked around and said, what happened here with Dave Wise? What happened? And Jim sort of, with frustration of sort, he said, oh, he can hold his mouth a certain way, like it's a gimmick, you know, like, whoop, all right. You know, he can hold his mouth a certain way and sound like anybody. And that was the end of that. But <clears throat> when, you, when you preached at the Los Angeles Temple. Oh, that's your question. Did you then, yeah, did you then try to basically imitate him? Did you just never, imitate never. And so when I was in that, because I left those two points hanging, thanks for reorning me. But it's real hard to have that stream of consciousness and stay on the subject. So, sure, thank you, Professor. That's so fine. what happened is, is I had that rental house, and I walked in and had a good echo. And I tried sounding like Jim Jones, and I realized that I could do that. And then I realized also, you'd better never do that 
around Jim Jones. Oh, yeah. Never do that around Jim Jones. And never let on that you can do that. Yeah. And never let on. So I spoke real humbly and tried to talk about love and tried to talk about humanitarian uh, aspect of the people's temple and tried to talk about things like that. I set up a program that everybody that needed a place through the um, so many years ago, what are the three letters, you know, all the th three letters think that they're G-O-D, but they're N-O-T. Anyway, the three letter agency, the Bureau of Housing and F Development or something? F or FHA Federal Housing Authority. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, I got programs where all of the people in the church got dirt, cheap, brand new apartments, all yeah. within walking distance of the church, and uh, things like this. And I went and looked in their cupboards, and I said uh, to Jim, I said, you know, people are giving you everything that they've got from their old age security and their social security and their disability check. And I go look in their cupboard, and when they don't have any food to eat, I'm going to tell you. He says, well, don't tell me. Get them food to eat. I said, how about I tell them to hold enough money back for groceries? And he couldn't answer me. I mean, clearly, he was supposed to have said, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what, so when... Um so he claimed he was doing all that publicly. He claimed he had set that program up. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, so what what was it that that finally led you after about five years in the temple to say, okay, uh, that's it, I'm done. Uh, when the church was becoming a creature that was just collecting money to perpetuate itself. Mm and it was no longer a live wire. When he had to claim the good things he was doing and then look over at something I was doing like the, the um, HUD or FHA or whatever I was doing and then claim that that's what he, I was happy. I didn't need personal credit, but I could see what is it that you're actually doing anymore. Mm. Uh, and so to continue just to become a machine which mm -hmm. collects money and be damned whether the people have a, and I saw things that were just uh, egregious and unacceptable. I remember this one gal, her name is Sister Mother Mason. Mother Mason uh, had all the common sense in the world. Mm -hmm. She was a wonderful, wonderful little old black lady that I loved. Now, she announced that these white girls that she had put up that asked if they could stay with her and uh, over the weekend they put her up uh, who happened to be uh, you know like uh, Karen Layton and Patty Cartmel this is the the dig through the trash group you know yeah and so um, so the bottom line is is that they had uh, basically stayed over and then she said they claim they took me to the hospital and got this cast put on my arm. And then Jim healed me of that broken arm and <clears throat> had, had me go back to the hospital or whatever to, to get an x-ray and show. And I said, where's the x-ray of the broken arm? She said, David, I never went uh, to the hospital. They gave me some kind of a drug. They said, I hit my head on the bathtub. She said, I would have known it. There's no way. I may be old, but I'm not crazy. Yeah. And she said, she always was on the front row, rooting Jim on, you know. And so when they did the healing, she didn't say, it's a setup. She came to me and said, so, Dave, I hate to tell you this, but they put a cast on my arm and then Jim tore, took it off and claimed me healed. She said, I'm not going to let it affect my dedication. Yeah. <clears throat> but, Do you know if this, what's her name? Her name was uh, Sis, uh, Mother Mason. Did, did she go to Guyana? Oh, I'm sure of it. <laughs> anyway, um, this young 
character is six years old, maybe. I think he has some world-class singing ability. And uh, he was uh, talking directly to Jim Jones over a microphone. I don't know how he got in that position. He was out in the crowd, and he had uh, all these relatives that loved him. And uh, he's gone now, you know. Uh, and um, you mean this this little boy is the little boy, yeah. And he was spunky. He died in Guyana. I was, that's what I was going to ask. You say he's gone. That's because he he died in Guyana. Yes, sir. At Jonestown. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, the um, the family just sat there while uh, Jim said, you know, uh, you know, what gives you the right to talk to me, to talk to God in the tone you're using? And this kind of thing to a little child, mm. you know, are you really going to wrestle your image back from a six-year-old? You Are you for real here? Are you for real? And then the next thing happened, he sent the nurse down, and I'm up on stage with a pastor's robe on, and I'm watching him whisper to the nurse, I see exactly what he's doing, and she goes and brings a knockout drink of water and Jim keeps saying I can see you're getting tired of and you you would like a glass of water wouldn't you you'd like a drink of water wouldn't you he kept trying to put the suggestion in the boy's head she brought him the water and he drank the water and he said now with the spirit I'm going to come into your body and I'm going to remove this rebellious spirit from your body and blah blah like that like that he knocked a child out then they took him to the ante room. The, off, the offertory room was on one side, and then this other uh, ante room was on the other side of the main part of the church. They took him over there, and there was a planning commission meeting uh, there. And uh, they took him in there. And the first thing I remember, uh, and the guy's alive today. He got out of the jail, you know, but Larry Layton talking like a ghost. Whoa. And I slapped him upside of the arm and said, stop that. What kind of insanity you're trying to terrorize the boy's subconscious mind while he's passed out laying on the floor? And why is he in this room passed out laying on the floor? What the hell is going on here? And uh, they had taken the boy from his mom and his family and under Jim's care. And he's laying on the floor in there passed out. And so then they wanted to, like, make ghost sounds or something while he's passed out. As it says, I told Larry, I said, pure, pure, unadulterated evil. You know, I ought to whoop your ass. And, and so it's the, it's the accumulation of this kind of stuff that in 1976 leads you to say, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. We, we often hear that when folks left the church, then they dealt with certain sorts of reprisals or problems. Oh, yeah. did, did, did you have any of those sort of experiences? They held me under guard. And then, you know, they said, we know, uh, you know, that uh, Dave is, uh, you know, taping the church for evidence and stuff like that. And so uh, you can find the FBI transcripts show that that's what they're talking about. The, the security members that were interviewed and yeah. after the uh, tragedy in Jonestown, and yeah. they talk about this, and people say, "Well, were you? Well, did you ever work for the FBI? All this kind of thing like that." Give me a break. I just didn't want to be a statistic. So, are, are you saying you you went to the FBI for protection because you were worried about the church? Is that is that? Oh, the, uh, the FBI came to me well after the you know fact. Well, after the fact, after Jonestown, and oh, they, they said uh, there appears to be the, the one gal that was the treasurer uh, shows that you and Tim Stone likely have a contract hit out on your life. So the thugs came to Denver, Colorado, and tried to beat me up. Oh, I see what you're saying. But I'd taken martial arts, and uh, all, all that uh, Paul Flowers just tore my shirt off. And I bloodied his nose, and that was the end of the fight. Because they caught up with me twice. I see. Okay. So you're living in your neighborhood for a while. 
And yeah, and so the first time they caught up with me, they brought me back. I escaped out of there with a trunk, lowering three floors down the window with my belongings, walked out past security, put the trunk in the back of the car, went to Gray Rabbit bus stop, and uh, they looked everywhere and couldn't find me or figure out where I'd gone. So finally they thought about Gray Rabbit, and they, they went there, and they said, um, Jim wants to talk to you on the telephone right now. I said, I'm not going to talk to Jim on the telephone and have him tell me I'm going to take a long walk off a short pier if I don't come back. You know, so it's not going to happen. And this was, uh, um, this was uh, Jim uh, McIlvain and um, the other guy that was head of security that wound up dead. A uh, wonderful friend of mine uh, wound up dead. Uh, great big, great big guy. Um, Chris, Chris was his name. You know, he died in Guyana. No, he died. Uh, people chased him down, shot him to death. Twenty-two. Wow. Uh, after that was a random crime, or that was people's temple. There's no way to prove it, but all the paranoid people thought for sure that it was that it was a hit. And then the and then when the Myrtles. Uh, died tied to a chair. The people generally don't think that it was a temple hit, but at the time they did. The 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 one son, I think it was, uh, was after the insurance or something. Collect the insurance, and he knew that he could pass it off as a maybe a people's temple hit. I see. Let me. They caught me. Yeah, they caught me oh. twice, and I made sure by changing my name that. They couldn't do that again. Wow. So I, I have a couple more questions as we as we wind down. So you you leave in '76, or, and it takes two attempts, but you you get out in '76. Um, what do you remember about your reaction <coughs> of November 18, 1978? What, what do you remember about? Well, when I, when, <coughs> well, I was telling people that Jim was on a road to his own destruction. I just did not know that he was going to take everyone with him. Uh, since he was so far out, it would have been like knowing Saddam Hussein. And the talk is so flowery, you would never know when it's true or when it's not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's Trump-like in a way, you know. Mm. Like the more he says, the more he can get away with. You know, mm -hmm. so people didn't believe that he would actually feed everyone uh, cyanide in their Kool-Aid, you know. But, you know, they're thinking, well, he's just, this is a behavioral modification control tactic of uh, some sort. You mean, but, uh, uh, like, the, the practicing that went on <clears throat> to, to practice for the big event, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I, you know, I told everybody he's on a road to his own destruction, and you need to get away for your own safety. And it was so pertinent uh, to me and real. I left members. I knew that I wouldn't even something in me. I knew I wouldn't live if I tried to fight him over members and have them go to another church. You know. But in any case, um, <clears throat> for him to take all these people from Los Angeles, and they wound up killing themselves. It's hard to deal with, um, because you asked, what could I have done differently? And uh, I'm the only person that's a survivor that you can't name anything that I did wrong that I'm aware of. Uh, I refuse to participate in wrongdoing. I have people that are survivors call me and tell me, Dave, I am. I just wanted to apologize for, I said, for what? Well, for breaking in your door and beating you up with everyone else. I said, well, such and such, that never happened. I said, it's a shame you people went around doing stuff like that. I don't have any singular incident where I ever even humiliated anyone in public. Yeah, and you had punishments within the church that took place within the church. You didn't participate in that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I caught, um, <clears throat> um, 
the one the one guy I was saying that was uh, Flowers. Uh, I, I caught uh, Paul Flowers really whooping a child back. And I said, I, I don't b actually believe in uh, corporal punishment. Mm. And I said, as far as I know, I'm the pastor here, the associate pastor of this church, and I don't want you whooping anyone ever again here. Well, to, to end up, um, what, you know, looking back, it's hard to believe, but we're, we're, we're over 40 years after Jonestown, the Jonestown tragedy of November 1978. When, when you look back, is there anything, is this just a bizarre story, you know, just um, this incredibly unfortunate story, or it, are there things that can be learned from it that are still useful? I mean, can, is there something, if you were standing in front of a, a group of college students and said, you know, and spent an hour talking about the pe People's Temple in Jonestown, and then when the students asked, but is there anything, is there sort of a, Aside from the historical story, is there something that we can really learn from that whole story, People's Temple, Jonestown? What, what, what would you say? What's, what's, <clears throat> a, what's a takeaway that's still relevant for us today? Uh, Dr. Jones, I believe the most important part is the take that I originally took on it has become more and more substantiated every year, and that's of society as a cult. Just because we are trained to believe in individual lone madmen, uh, mad dog uh, uh, headed cults, we're, we're blind to realize, and I think I've helped introduce the connection where people can look at parts of society as cult-like. Uh, but understanding that a man, Jim Jones, uh, that is, who specialized in um, mind and behavior control tactics was not especially creative as much as he was an ex exquisite copycat. He would copy things he knew worked that were practiced in business, in the military, in churches with religion, uh, in um, sports, in any kind of behavior, in whether it was a dog pack and bringing out a dog pack theory, or whether it was uh, taking your enemy and building them up and building them up and building them up and uh, before you dispose of them or something. Yeah. And he studied, you know, driven, I suppose, by insecurity-based uh, narcissism and a desire for power that seemed to necessitate that he hide what would have been compelling eyes with a soul and, um, and, and behind glasses so that he could be, do not look behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. Do not look at the man behind the curtain. Get away from the curtain, you know. Mm -hmm. So that basically he could be a, a mystery and a power Controlling people's minds is the wish of monopoly and crooked governments. For us to, to see cult behavior in society around us is priceless, and it has become more and more vital, um, requisite uh, behavior for us to somehow demand of ourselves to, to be able to have, instead of just being one of the many trout swimming in whatever unknown direction, or one of the many lemmings, you know, headed, reassured by the fact that there's a whole crowd that believe that we're the best and that we're right, you know. Well, David Parker Wise, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to share these memories. Um, I think, you know, I, I think it's important, especially, I mean, I, we're at the place now where college students uh, have no living memory of 9-11, believe it or not. And so, um, you know, I, I think a lot of my students have never heard of People's Temple. They don't, they don't know anything about Jones Temple. <clears throat> I'm really glad you're trying to may, keep it alive within the study uh, 
curriculum uh, to look at this kind of a world uh, class event that took place and uh, and and we've got to remember that uh, Jim was a little of right and a little of wrong that that <clears throat> if if people hadn't kissed his butt when they were voting some of the people that have taken part in movies right now there's the recordings of them voting to all drink Kool-Aid not voting to reverse defect during the Cold War to Russia it's plan A or plan B what do you vote for and the people making movies now blaming Jim are on tape saying let's just end it all right now and go down in history as this mass suicide and stuff like that you know <clears throat> and um, outside of his personal failures sexual deviant uh, I would say from my experiences of studying him yeah uh, you know and I'd say um, um, and the word deviant is dangerous you know just say you know sexually ill or something like that you know but I mean what we've got is is lots of things wrong with him including drug addiction <clears throat> but was it that bad of an idea except that he was now wanted in the United States uh, was it that bad of idea to do a reverse defection to the Soviet Union that's pretty brilliant during the Cold War as a social statement of human uh, conditions in America or how many children go to bed hungry blah blah yeah things like that you're, so, you're talking about when the idea was raised there in Guyana the possibility of going from Guyana to the Soviet Union this famous, or this not famous, but I mean, for those who study it, this interaction between Christine Miller and Jim Jones, uh, the day of the tragedy, where she's saying, "Look, um, why don't we just go to Russia instead of I'll kill ourselves?" And she was my good friend, and she was a, a feisty gal. So you knew. Uh, Chris, take a minute and tell us about Christine. Christine was um, the last conversation that I had with her is. Uh, she said, I don't just don't understand uh, why you would have left the church. You were so dedicated. I don't I don't get it. And I said, without creating a big hullabaloo right now, because they had come and they had found me and brought me back. And the next time they found me, I wasn't going back. I didn't go back willingly the first time. I went back kind of under guard okay and uh, and so but anyway the bottom line is is uh, I said without creating a big hullabaloo Christine there are things you don't know about I said accept it from me that Jim is on a road to his own self-destruction and there are things you don't know about and that's when I told the first times I'd use the words and power trips and humiliation tactics. So those two phrases avail themselves to me at a time, you know, you'd say, well, I thought you were an intellectual young man, you know. Oh, well, that's the first time I ever used power trips and humiliation tactics, you know, because that, and so I told her that, and I said, and frankly, I seriously believe that he is I'm not going to say molesting people, but that he's engaging in very, very questionable, getting in questionable situations in that area. And uh, she said, I don't believe it. I said, I said, it's your life. And the, the one gal that I had um, gotten with when I left the church, and there are reasons I figured that I felt that it was hard to do going to be hard to do hard to, leave. Leave. hard to leave without someone there helping me on the other end yeah uh, and then that's when I got with one else smart and then I uh, and Karen Layton came along and said you mean you're having sex with one else smart she you're just having her uh, she couldn't say just like Jim you know you're having sex with her to get her to do what you want you know she said, you should have to marry her. I said, I'm happy to marry her. 
I'm happy to marry her, you know? Wow. And so, so I said, hey, come with me and let's go get married so people can't run their mouth, you know? And we went to um, Reno, Reno, got married there. I got her out. Jim McElvain was um, our head of security, real tall, big guy. Yeah. And she was, he was uh, her uncle. And my head treasurer, K. N. Olin Nelson, uh, was the head treasurer. And that was uh, one L's, the girl that I married, that was her mother. And one L had four lovely children, lovely children. I got her at the opposition and the difficulty against her uncle and her mom. I went, I went to Denver, got a place for us to go, and went back. And they were saying, you see, look at that new car he's driving. He's working for the FBI. I said, it's called a U-Haul. I, I mean, a U-Drive. A, a, a they don't have it anymore, I don't think. But yeah, it's a U-Drive. Yeah. You sign up, you get their car, you deliver it across the country. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so I got her and her kids out of the church. And then we were sitting on a balcony, and she said, I'm, I'm going to let the kids go back to the church. So she said, I'm going to let the kids go back because my mom can watch the kids while I go to work for the SBA. I said, if you let the kids go back after I went and saved you and saved the kids, and you let them go back, it's over between us. I said, it's life or death. I said, I have gone to each of those kids and told them their life is in danger in that church. Did they go back? Did so her kids, went back, her kids went back. All four of her kids died in Guyana, along with her uncle and her mom. I remember having the conversation with their biological father and how hurt he was and how he wanted to blame me, the guy that had got him out of there. You know, And I had made it clear to him. And I remember how... Um, <clears throat> how hard it was for 1L. She can never live with herself. She's getting up in years now. Uh, you know, I was pretty mature uh, from the age of 19 to uh, 24, 25, or whatever it was. I was pretty mature for uh, a young a young kid. I remember her mom, uh, Kay, saying, I thought you were 30. Mm. You're telling me you're 19? I thought you were 30 years old. And did, uh, did their mom actually go to Guyana, or did or did she not go? She, she went there two or three times. Okay, but uh, you know, so it really hurts her. Um, and and so the older boy, he became pretty popular in. Uh, so everyone's going to know his name. Uh, he became pretty popular in Jonestown. Well, Mr. David Parker Wise, I really appreciate you uh, you taking the time to talk with us and to share these memories with us. I appreciate it. Um, it's an important part of the story, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.